and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us from the World Anvil, now... Previously here with Broken Tales, now with the latest addition to the growing family of Monada Echo, in the form of Valraven, Chronicles of Blood and Iron, the one and only Tommaso De Benetti. How you doing Hello, today, man? and thank you for having me again. Actually, I think this might be the third time we meet, because we, yeah. if I'm correct, we also did one for... Uh, Dead Air Seasons, which is our latest game. It, I might be mistaken, but I think we did one for that as well. Um, I'd have to... Good. Yeah, but uh, we, we can check, but I feel that this is the third time we meet. At least uh, <laughs> at least we've th been speaking more than twice, but yeah. This is okay. the third time, but I didn't do one on um, Dead Air. The last oh, time okay. I had one was for Broken Tales Lost Stories. All right. Shame on you! It's it's a great game. <laughs> we uh, should do one on that as well. It it is. It's it's just around the time around the time that it was happening, I was completely swamped, so I couldn't find a way to squeeze it in. All right, but so maybe we discussed it and then never did it. But anyway, I'm happy to be here now for uh, uh, Raven: The Chronicles of Blood and Iron, mm -hmm. uh, which will launch on uh, Backer Kit crowdfunding uh, the eighth of May, uh, mm -hmm. barring some. Uh, worldwide disaster but uh, that's the plan so yeah. uh, it's uh, less than a month from now and i'm uh, getting ready for for the launch yeah but since dead air was brought since dead air was brought up that's a that's a good starting point to get to um this since both dead air and this are using your monad echo system yeah uh, as well as broken tales so it's always the same system um, so a bit of uh, history here. Uh, Val Raven, The Chronicles of Blood and Iron, it's uh, a, a translation from uh, a game that already exists in Italian. Mm -hmm. We published it in 2020, I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, technically speaking, the second game using the system. Uh, we never did the translation uh in uh, after that we did uh, broken tales and after that we did dead Air seasons which is uh, uh basically available from now um all the shipments to to the backers have uh i mean they, they're either already arrived or they are um doing the journey so uh if you go now on our website you can get uh that that game which is the the newest one we have and it's uh, just to give you a very quick uh, idea it's uh, if you like atmospheres like uh, the last of us um that is a game that uh plays with that but but uh, it's very focused on a community of survivors so everything yeah. um goes around this this community of survivors and uh it's very important how you uh, face every crisis there are seasons passing because that will impact your your own community so mm -hmm. so that's the, the kind of game um of course, in um, in the time uh, from the first publication of the Raven, and now uh, we we've, we've done a couple more games. We released the SRD for the system, which is like uh, the the plain system that people can download for free. It's available on Drive Through RPG. It's available on our website. It's released under Creative Commons, so you can make your own game with it. Um, and um, every iteration uh, of the system. Uh, we found better ways to explain things, and uh, we feel that at this point things are pretty sharp. Uh, so when we decided to do the translation of a Raven, which uh, was one of, of the most requested um, games that that we had from our English-speaking community at the time of Broken Tales, I did a survey like what kind of games you want to see from us. Mm -hmm. Raven uh, ranked very high. Uh, it took us a while to get around to it um, because this stuff is slow to to do. Um, but uh, we decided that okay, now it's a good time to to release an English edition, and of course we want to incorporate all the updates that we've been doing in the system. 
the the principles are exactly the same uh we improve the way things are explained and some of the terminology um because initially maybe some terms were a bit confusing to people so we found better way to explain it and uh well mm, the 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 english edition over raven will include the, all the latest developments so you get the the best system uh possible in in this edition yeah yeah, and I, I do have to I do have to do a bit of self correcting because it wasn't until Dead Air that I that I started seeing the term um, Monad Echo being used as the name for the system. So that was um, a... I do believe we have it uh, called that way in Broken Tales, um, but I'm not one hundred percent sure at this at this point. But anyway, it is the same system. Mm -hmm. It's just that uh, the principles are the same in every game, and then there are different ways to apply it to, to each game. Um, Broken Tales uh, has a bit lighter version of the system on it, uh, running it, and then uh, Dead Air is slightly more crunchy because it is trying to do different things. And for example, in um, Broken Tales, all your characters are super powerful from the very beginning because they are this kind of, they are supposed to be the villains of the stories that now are turned into hunters for, for the order. So uh, it makes sense that they're very powerful from the beginning and their development, it exists, but it doesn't make them uh, 10 times stronger. While in Dead Air Seasons, so you are um, playing a survivor, so you are supposed to be weak <laughs> and have some uh, uh, very heavy human flow flows. So the system needed to be adapted to that. And um, I'm happy to say that, for example, in that game, we use the same principles uh, that run the whole system, which are, for example, descriptors and the expense of Soma, etc., even to um, treat the community of characters as it was a, a big character, if you want, in a way. So everything kind of works in the same way, and I'm very happy of that because it completely makes sense. It makes the, the game very easy to understand. And once you get that basic structure of the system, uh, then it applies to to different things uh, within the system. We don't have separate combat system that is very different from how you do any other action. And um, this also will apply in Barreven. We have some special special rules just for this game, but but if you have played any of the other games before, you you will be uh, right at home. Uh, playing this one i think i feel that i need to say what this game is <laughs> because we haven't said it yet yeah uh, it is it is our fantasy game it's a fantasy game it's very different as far as you can imagine from dnd &D. um uh, the the main inspirations here have been berserk the the manga from kentaro miura mm -hmm. which uh unfortunately was never finished because because uh, miura died uh, i think it, it was last year um and then it's, um can one of, one of his pro, one of his proteges has been continuing it. Yeah, I I've heard about that. I haven't seen anything of the new stuff yet. Um, I have a, a very strong attachment to the series. Like my nickname online for many years has been uh, Guts. So um, which is the the main character of Berserk. Um, I was a super big fan. I kind of it kind of lost me at some point because I didn't like. Uh, the final part of the of the story, uh, how where, how is it was going? It was going very slow, and it kind of changed the tone very much. But I think like the first maybe two hundred chapters, because I think uh, we are around now four hundred chapters. I think the first two hundred uh, are amazing, and uh, I I've been rereading them recently, and I I think they still hold up. And I, I, if I'm correct, it's been over twenty years since the first issue. So, um, of course, there are some things that maybe <laughs> they're a bit over the top for, for 2024. Um, but in general, I think it's it's one of the most interesting mangas out there um, for for um, the the way it is drawn and uh, the story tells. And, and uh, um, I mean, I, I, there's very little like it. But other sources of inspirations are uh, A Song of Ice and Fire, uh, which kind of fits the more or less the same vibe we are going for, and and in a minor way also uh, Dragon Age, which is a bit more fantasy than than Bar Raven, um, but it has some uh, interesting uh, 
twists in in how um, the classic fantasy uh, races are are, are represented. Uh, um, j just to, to mention one, uh, the elves in in uh, um, Dragon Age are this kind of lower case that that, that is uh, closed into this kind of ghettos, and and I always thought that it was an interesting um, change from the classic Tolkien uh, high elves and, and 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 that kind of stuff. Um, Var Raven doesn't el elves and and dwarves. It's uh, mostly humans. Uh, and if you're familiar with Berserk, um, oh, yeah. you will you will feel right at home. Um, the main idea here is that there are two. Uh, well, there is a continent. It's called Var Raven. Um, there's a, on one side there's the uh, Erinwald Empire uh, in the north, and uh, then on the other side uh, in the south there is the Republic of Dormas. And these two uh, forces have been fighting this this war for hundreds of hundreds of years. They've been contending uh, some territories in the middle, uh, which are now called the borderlands, uh, which are just ruins in practice. And uh, every fifty years, somebody advances, takes a city, and then uh, and then other fifty years, and the city goes out to the other side. Uh, so there is this war where nobody really remembers exactly why they're even fighting it. And uh, it's this this kind of um, fairly. Um, it, it's not a realistic middle age, but but it is inspired by realistic mid middle age because as as we will see soon, there's magic, there's demons, there's other stuff. Um, so another of the forces in play here is the uh, Holy Church of Light, uh, which is this cult in practice that tries to keep um, their foot. Uh, in both shoes, um, the Republic of Dormas and the Erevald Empire, because they they understand that uh, if they can make them believe into something higher, they can kind of control their resources, um, run their churches, uh, trying to steer opinions through their faith. So there's, there's also this force. Then we have a, a, another couple of interesting factions that uh, are part of the Varraven mythology. Uh, from the east, we have this invader uh, called the Darokar, uh, which are very mysterious. They use like uh, these uh, giant titans, which are this this giant animals, uh, war animals, to to wage war in a way that um, most of the people on Varraven doesn't even understand completely, uh, and nobody knows exactly um, what they want, but they are trying to invade from one of the coasts. Uh, and the last faction in play um, is the uh, end of the Hand of the Abyss, uh, which is this demonic um, faction that uh, is enslaving some people, trying to attract them with promises of uh, air, um, easy riches, uh, lust, uh, and all the kind of... Well, if you're familiar with Berserk, you know exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. Uh, um, they they have some representation on on Varraven uh, in the form of these incarnates, which are the most powerful beings of these demonic forces. Um, we don't have a fixed number of incarnates uh, in the in the in the two books uh, of Varraven. We offer a few options. Uh, they are trying to merge the world uh, of, uh, of of humans uh, with the world of the spirits, which is. Uh, where magic comes from. So the idea there is that they're trying to create this gate to to merge the two worlds and basically uh, have the world of, of the spirits um, completely invading the, the world of humans. Um, there's another faction which is a bit on 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 their own. It's the Great North, where the um, the fairy people uh, live, and the uh, the more uh, savage of the humans, uh, you can think about them a, a bit like Vikings and things. They're not exactly Vikings, but they're people that are used to uh, live live in woods and in the cold. Um, there are many creatures that are living there. There are uh, witches, uh, so it's an interesting area. It's maybe the one that has a bit less influence on the continent. Uh, and, and and the main idea of the game is that the players are all part of this uh, um, band of mercenaries. So you're all part of this of this band. You can create your band together with the rest of the group. You can give it a name. You can give it a special um, uh, specialization, and uh, um, pick between uh, 
uh, one of 11 roles that fit the, the mercenary unit. And, uh, and they interact between them in, in, in certain ways that we think the, they are interesting. So this is the basic premise uh, of the game. Mm -hmm. Now, within within the core within the core mechanics of thi of things, one of the <clears throat> first things to note in, in the system is the concept of soma. Would yeah. so would soma be th be this game's equivalent to um, extra effort. I know. I know. I know that some people will look at the word and, and associate it with the drug, but I always associate it with the Indian equivalent of um, nectar. Um, what soma is in all our games, actually, not just in this game, uh, it's your. It's a representation of your willpower. So the 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 way uh, we call them checks. The way they work, it's uh, it's like this. Basically, you you describe what your character wants to do, and uh, every Monad Echo um, game starts from the narrative. What we mean with with that is that you first describe exactly how your character is doing something. You you don't say I hit the enemy. That's not a description. Uh, you say exactly how you do that. So, uh, I don't know, uh, I, I take the uh, knife that I have in my booth and then I do a somersault and try to stab him in the groins. That is a description. Um, so, if the MC, which is the master of the Chronicles, the GM, if you want, uh, think that uh, your character is uh, can do that based on certain things like the, the kind of role he has or the kind of descriptor he has, if you think that that is um, an action that should, given this, the, the context, should happen easily, then you don't even need to do a check. Um, if... Uh, there's some obstacle of some kind, and and um, maybe the the enemy is aware, or of course they don't want to be stabbed, things like that. Then you do this position check. We call it position check because it is supposed to bring your character in this narrative position that you have described. Uh, now um, you do a position check when your character is trying to do something, and you do a defense check when the MC, the GM put something in between you and the position where you want to be. So they are the same kind of uh, check. They work in the same way. It's just that who is calling calling them uh, that is different. Like the position check is when the character actively is trying to do something. And the defense check is when something is actually trying to stop the character. Um, now, the way it works is that usually you have to to at least reach one we call it a level of opposition think about it as the difficulty of this check this test mm -hmm. you have to at least reach that that um, that number and to do that you can do it in a few uh, ways first of all you start from a number that is your attribute that makes more sense uh, var raven uh, as a um, an interesting approach. Um, we call them attributes, but they're actually approaches. Uh, for example, one of the approaches is ferocity. Are you trying to do this action with ferocity, or are you trying to do it with empathy? Because you can try to do the same thing in different ways, and according to whatever um, is your description, then one attribute would be more uh, fitting than the other. So you start from that number and you need to reach this uh, opposition level number. To reach it, you have uh, um, a couple of options. Uh, the first one is to spend Soma, which is your willpower. And every point you spend gives you one point in this check. So you can fit, uh, fill that gap in, in this way. The other way you have is that you can roll dice. But, but the trick here is that um, when you roll uh, dice, um, if you get even a single one on one of the dice you roll, then the whole action fails. And uh, this is important because when I give you an opposition level, you can decide how well you want to 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 uh, succeed in this action. So you can just reach the opposition level and then you obtain an outcome with a cost. It means that what you described happens, but there is something that happens to you in exchange. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit um, like other games have a similar concept. Or you can you can uh, aim to a, a standard outcome, uh, which is the opposition level plus one, and then that means that you 
succeed exactly how you describe the action. Or you can uh, try to reach two points over the position level and then you get an outcome with an increment, which means not only you get exactly what you described, you also get something extra that um, it can be uh, some environmental um, kind of bonuses or sometimes these increments are also used to activate special effects uh, on the gifts that the characters characters have. Gifts uh, are pretty much the special abilities or if you want the powers of the characters. So uh, there is this dynamic of a risk and reward where you can roll as many dice as you want to try to reach the highest result. But of course, the more dice you roll, the, easiest, the easier it is to get uh, a one, which will make the whole thing fail. Um, or you can use Soma, but you have a, only a certain amount of this uh, limited resource. Or you can mix the two things, which means that you might bet some Soma, but also roll some dice, which introduce a risk in your in your uh, endeavor. So it's an interesting system because uh, uh, players will be very often forced to take some uh, um, uh, outcome with a cost, which is always interesting for the game because yes, you, you succeed in what you're trying to do, but there's also something else happening and that creates a lot of uh, dynamism in the action. Um, or you might want to think strategically and save Soma for, for something that you think is going to come later on. Um, I think that it takes a little bit to get used to it, but as soon as it clicks for players, uh, I've seen very few people coming back from the system uh, because it, it works so well and it's easy to to remember. Like once you get the main uh, uh, mechanic, the whole thing works the same way. And and that, um, well, people seem happy about it, so, so I am too. <laughs> yeah. Now earlier you mentioned you mentioned a series of roles when it came to <clears throat> a mercenary group. Yeah, I'd, I'd like you to dive into what what exactly those roles entail. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I have to say that we had a long discussion with members of our community on how to translate these roles in English, uh, because uh, in the Italian uh, version of the game. Um, they used some names that uh, were historically researched uh, but make sense only if you have some kind of knowledge about m uh, middle age europe and and it's not just the knowledge you will get from watching game of thrones it would be a bit more um deeper and it turns out that we don't want to do that because people might have a lot of questions about what is this thing <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, I, I, some people even suggested just leave the names in italian and they sounded nice but i think people would be very confused about what, what these roles are so we decided to go with um, some translations that have some flavor but are not impossible to understand if you didn't have a middle age <laughs> that's that's the point um so uh right now uh the core book will started the campaign with 11 roles the italian version had eight and then we unlocked three during the campaign for that for for, for that edition but in this edition we are going to have all the roles unlocked from the beginning i thought it didn't make any sense to keep them gated because they already exist and they make the game better so let's put everything into this english book um i can read you the names and then we can go into each one so we have the men at arms the captain the lieutenant the Devout, the Dragon, the Shadow Agent, the Outcast, the Witch, the Sawbones, the Scholar, and the Noble. Yeah. Uh, now, um, some of those I there think are, are going to be oh, are going <clears> to <throat> self-explanatory just from the name, but yeah. there's a few. Th there's a few like the Dragon, for instance, that I think might deserve a little bit more diving into. Yeah, that is one of the of those that uh, we had more discussion about. Um, it is basically one kind of elite unit, uh, elite melee unit, uh, but it's not exactly what I would call a berserk, uh, like not completely mindless uh, super warrior. It's a bit more, uh, even in, in rank, it's a bit higher than uh, these men at arms, which are the, the 
the cannon fodder if you want. And now one interesting thing about this game is that oh, you don't see it in the quick start because it's one of the rules that will be only in the final book. But there is a difference in rank between these units because we want to simulate that that thing that okay you're part of a unit and uh, there are officials and you have to in theory um, listen to their orders and, and that kind of stuff. And uh, accord like the rank will give you some kind of social um, uh, perks uh, when when you 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 use it. Uh, but this doesn't mean at all that uh, the units that are of the lower rank they um, are at a disadvantage because they, they might be um, supposed to answer some orders in certain situations but they also have access to some skills that, that other roles don't have at all. So um, we, we try to, to balance things very well in a way that, okay, you're, you might be lower in rank, but you can do, you are the only one who can do this specific thing. So um, there is that, that kind of balance there. Uh, other, I can try to, 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 to go through them a bit um, quickly, but first of all, um, players can have characters of any gender. We decided not to, like, the men at arms uses this name because that's kind of the historically accurate way to call that kind of unit. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, in the illustration, we have a, um, a woman, and it's a very strong-looking woman. So, so you you can definitely be uh, whatever you want to be. We have the witch, which can be uh, female or male; it doesn't matter. We we didn't we decided not to do the witch witcher you know the kind of uh like it doesn't matter like you are a witch and you can be whatever gender you want so so that is uh something we wanted to cover and um so men at arms i said it is it is the basic unit that forms the uh, the mercenary unit um they are uh, those on the front lines uh, but it's also the unit uh, without which the the mercenary unit doesn't doesn't exist uh, uh, plainly put we have the captain which is more the strategic mind of the of the unit uh, we have the lieutenant which takes care of the troops and and is the in in general it's the um, right hand of the captain has a lot of skills that uh, have to do with morale um, we have the devout which um, is somebody who has a very strong faith uh, for something and can take advantage of that uh, for uh, prayers and and, uh, and and moral and uh, helping um, the mental health of the other characters. Uh, we have the dragon, as I said, is some kind of elite warrior unit, uh, not completely mindless, even though this is a discussion I had many times with Alberto, which is the main author of the game, uh, that in his description in the italian version he, he, he makes them sound very much like berserker and so i think we might want to do some tweaks there uh, because when i was saying okay let's call it berserker then he was saying no it's absolutely not a berserker so it's like okay we need to tune this a bit because uh, even the illustration has been very inspired by guts so people might have the wrong feeling when they when they get to this character if we uh, describe it as a berserker we make it look him a bit like guts with a giant sword you know um so it is uh, this is a bit more uh sophisticated than that then we have the shadow agent that can be a spy can be an assassin mm -hmm. uh, the outcast is somebody who um generally uh used to live into this borderlands that is now this uh uh, no man's land in the middle between the Republic of Dormus and, and the Erevald Empire. We have the witch, uh, which is somebody who somehow can have a dialogue with the spirit world and uh, tap into that power. And it can be a positive power or it can be a negative power. We have the, the uh, each each of these roles has two different versions, so you can pick which one feel fits more with your uh, play style. I think. Then we have the soul bones, which is the medic, uh, but given the tools and the time period we are referencing, it's more about like, uh, yeah, cutting your leg if something goes wrong, <laughs> things like that. <clears throat> Sorry. Then we have the scholar, uh, which is a strange mix of um, an alchemist uh, and an inventor. And then we have the noble, which is the one who probably has the good contacts at court, 
has the money to purchase uh, uh, equipment for the unit and, and uh, things like that. Uh, one thing I haven't said is that the game has a four season uh, structure. They are not um, seasons intended as winter, spring, uh, summer and autumn. They are the season of the war. And uh, that means that, um, well, first of all, you can play the game as a single mission and, and that's it. But if you want to, to do a campaign, um, the main book will contain um, uh, guidelines to, to create this kind of war campaign, which involves um, a season where you are probably going to fight into one of these giant battles with a lot of units, and we have rules to so that the zoom is always on your characters and your unit. But if you want uh, to figure out, okay, uh, how is this army faring against this other army, we have super quick rules to determine that in, in a blink. Like, you, there's no calculation. You don't have to open an Excel file for that. Um, it's all very narrative. But we want to be able to have giant battles, if you want. Um and then we have like uh, there's a season that is focused on uh, uh, advancing the agenda of the various factions. So it means maybe defeating a certain boss, or taking a certain city. Um, it's it's like the mission that has the final objective of that season of war. Then we have uh, one season that is called uh, um, uh, the, um, season, uh, the season of poisons. I'm not completely sure how we we're gonna translate it yet, but but the, the direct translation would be Season of Poison, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, where you have all the intrigue uh, in the courts. It's more a political uh, part of the game. Uh, you can have deals with the nobles. You can try to get new jobs. So you can try to assassinate people, that, that kind of stuff. And then we have a final season um, that is focused on uh, the... It zooms in into the, the the mercenary unit and the characters uh, because each of them has a dream that he, uh, he or she is trying to pursue, and uh, um, it focuses on on pursuing those dreams. Uh, so there are, if you want, like some little side stories about the characters that are trying to accomplish something. It could be send money home to their family. It could be escaping the unit to go somewhere else. It could be um resolving uh forbidden love i don't know whatever you want and um an interesting mechanic that that also uh reflects thematically very well with the references is that in that season we determine how much you're willing to sacrifice to get that um to fulfill that dream and uh, are you willing to step over your companions to to do that mm -hmm. uh so that is an interesting part because uh, uh, like we can zoom out very much and then you see this uh, giant battlefields and then we can zoom in into the single character and what they are trying to achieve uh, so that's that's how the the game uh, is uh, structured mm -hmm. now one of the other major pillars is the path of perdition and I'd like to go into what that particularly entails yeah, so that is another mechanic that was inspired by Berserk and uh, whoever knows the manga or has seen the anime, um, they know that the protagonist um, goes down a very dark path at some point, a path of revenge, and a path where to get stronger, he loses himself a bit. And uh, we wanted to have a mechanic like that. So um, that's the path of perdition. Um, the characters can absorb a certain number of wounds before being uh, getting out of the game, uh, being killed, or uh, be, like losing a limb, or whatever, having very serious uh, consequences. However, um, at any time, characters can decide to uh, advance one stage on this path of perdition, to avoid the wound. When they do that, they can describe how the wound that they would have gotten, um, how they managed to avoid it. Uh, but to do that, um, somehow they tap into the darker side of their self and they, they lose something. And according to 
basically these path operations are usually based on attributes so you can decide down which road you go and how that fits with your character um but the idea there is that uh, you become an uglier version of yourself and um and you have to play that out so if you decide to do a stage uh then your character also gets that feature that is described in the stage i give you an example um for example i'm looking at the um, at the character sheet of amethyst the scholar which is one of the characters uh, you can find in the quick start uh, which is now available on the landing page of the um, of the uh, kind of hyping people for the campaign um in their first in her first stage she she will have this descriptor added to to the other descriptor that she has uh, that says i always want to earn something so when you're playing her you have to remember that now she's always trying to get something out of whatever she's doing and if she goes to stage two then she also starts to think that the end often justifies the means so she's becoming a bit uglier and then at stage three she says stepping on others to get to the goal then maybe she starts to hurt her companions to to get to where she needs to be and then at stage four which is the last one everything is a means to a victory friend or foe there is no difference so you you can see that she uh, she's spiraling out of control and she might become actually a problem for uh, the company. You can go back from the um, this path of perdition, uh, but while it is active, uh, your character might become a liability in a way. Mm -hmm. And each of them can have a different direction. So uh, let me let me find another. For example, um, Hadric the lieutenant, another character we have there. Um, he starts to get afraid. He's the lieutenant. He's supposed to lead the men. But then on stage one, he starts to think, I want to leave. So he's not maybe ready to sacrifice himself anymore for anyone. And on stage two, he says, I reject the violence. I want to prevent innocent death. So at, at some point, he even stopped uh, wanting to, to fight. So you can see how this um, changes, how the character is. Mm -hmm. And usually they become the contrary of what they would normally be. Uh, so that is, we think it's a mechanic that is very thematic with, with uh, sources and um, it creates uh, some great fun at the table. Yeah, I, I, can, cer I can certainly get that. Now, with <clears> one <throat> of the mechanics that you, that you mentioned, which, you're, which um, it sounds like you're going to be retitling because translating straight from Italian to English didn't doesn't quite fit but is basically depicting the more the more um i i guess po i guess political end of thi end of things um how do you man how would you manage that in a way that allow allows the majority of the table to still in to still engage with it since it's very easy to have the hacking problem where it becomes a duet um i mean we don't really have like hard mechanical rules to make people um okay now you have to do diplomacy it's more uh, of a framing for the gm to create uh scenes that will uh put characters out of a battlefield and somewhere else where they might have other kind of problems and um well one example i can give you um is that okay now they are invited to this banquet uh, at the court of uh, one lord that, that might uh want to use their services and uh well somebody gets really drunk and then there are problems starting at the table and then how do they want to deal with them like do they want to start stabbing people that uh, are supposed to be the people that uh, pay their wages or um, do they risk offending uh, this lord or this other lord uh, or do they run away with the um, son of one of, of the people on the table so um, it is it is a set of um, they're not instructions they're guidelines for 
how to create a campaign that includes all these aspects of what you probably want. It's more of a pacing mechanism. So um, we have suggestions in the book on how you could do that, uh, what kind of uh, events could, could manifest. Um, so it's a set of suggestions on how to, to do that. It's not forcing anybody to do anything. But if you think, okay, maybe um, it could be, I don't know, while the captain and the lieutenant are enjoying wine with the king, um, the uh, shadow agent could try to uh, grab some documents that uh, are kept in the treasury. So it's more that kind of thing. Because otherwise, in the other seasons, you are probably going to be outside a city wall um, uh, in the battlefield, uh, um, scouting some region, um, trying to figure out a problem far away from where uh, your the people who um, commissioned your your uh, job are and, and things like that. So um, we just wanted to give the whole experience of how it is to be a mercenary unit. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly get that. And since you're dealing with with managing a mercenary unit, do you have are there any um, framings or, or anything like that when it comes to the management of of things on the macro scale? Some something far something akin to say the winter phase that's in Pendragon. Um, I my last game of Pendragon was over fifteen years ago, <laughs> so I'm, I'm afraid I'm not very updated on the latest uh, editions. Um, the the seasons are, are are divided like this as i mentioned like one is for usually huge scale battles one is for final confrontations or or anyway uh this um these events that would uh, advance the agenda of one faction because every faction in this game and this is also represented in the map of the game um we will provide a map, it's in the book, and it's also available as a separate add-on, and people that join the campaign uh, early, they can get it for free. It's this giant map where we have all the cities in Bar Raven, and we show there uh, which one is the um, faction that is governing that area, but also um, there are some icons for the, the the factions that are emerging in that area, and the the, the map of our Raven has been created in a way that uh, whenever you want to go, uh, you're always uh, somehow annoying at least a third faction. So, for example, um, if you want to go from one side uh, of um, the Republic of Dormus to one city in Erinwald most likely you will have at some point to cross some territory from the that that is in the in the hands of the darokar uh, and this creates these interesting dynamics where it's very rare that you have only two factions involved there's at least three um and and for this reason um the the macro scale it's uh well it, it depends what do we mean because if we uh, if we mean like uh, there are there's help for the GM to to create this kind of drama, absolutely yes. Uh, if you mean like uh, do we have rules to uh, for for huge units to to fight each other? Yes, we have that as well. And then you can uh, uh, zoom in and and you can focus the fight on what you, the guys in your unit that are played by the characters are actually doing. So it's very flexible. It's very flexible. It doesn't require a lot of math. Um, it's not like... Uh, I remember when I was a kid, uh, I had this photocopied version of uh, um, Dungeons and Dragon, uh, the, 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 black, the black book. It was the third one of three. There was the red book, there was the blue book, and there was the, the black one. Yeah, that would, I, be back, that would be the Back Me it, era. Uh, I think it was called Immortals. Could it, could it be uh, Immort something like that? Immortals. What if it was the Black Book? It would probably be Ma it would probably be um, Master. Immortals was kind of a light blue. Mm, I feel that maybe in Europe we had different uh, books, but but okay, it could anyway. It was the most advanced D and D book you could get at the time. I didn't have the original. I had photocopies, so <laughs> I was a pirate at that time. But. Um, 
I remember that in that book there were rules to yeah, to play. I just, I just double check. The I have to correct myself. The Immortals book was was um gold. The black one was the master um rules. Okay. Well, anyway, I, I I had the book and I remember there were rules for war. They were really nice. Uh, like when I was a kid, I loved them. But I remember there was a lot of math involved, and this is definitely not that game. Like yeah. we want you to be able to tell a story. Um, anytime we can, we make it so that like mechanics are intruding as little as possible, and only when uh, they add something to the game. So other than that, everything is going to be very narrative uh, oriented, and that um, reflects on how the characters are described. They're described from who they are more than the numbers they have on this sheet, and what they can do more than the numbers they have on the sheet. So, so that's a, that's a philosophy we have in all, all of our games that the numbers are important, but but up to a point, and the, it's not a game of uh, min maxing at all. Yeah. Now. When I look at the pregens, one of the other things that I, that I note is that is that beyond, beyond the stats, each of them has four um, p has four pillars, and three of those pillars grant a, grant a certain gift. Those pillars being roll, dark past, art of war, and bond. Yeah, they are a bit simplified here in the quick start. Um, uh, we have five in the final game. Um, but yeah, basically, um, the way your character is described is uh, uh, through this. Uh, we call we call them background steps. Mm -hmm. So in the final game, we're gonna have uh, your role, um, which is who you are in the company. Then there's the dark past, um, which is self-explanatory, meaning like each of this character has done something they're not proud of in the past, and, and we need to define what that is. Um, then there's the art of war, which is how you fight. And this is also an interesting one, because uh, uh, if you are down the road to perdition, uh, the, the power associated with this uh, background step um, gets stronger. So you have incentive in actually getting a bit uglier as a character. <laughs> Um, and then in the final game, we are going to have two more. One about your um, uh, your character, like uh, intended as uh, your personality. Um, we will have to see how to translate that because in English, we have to... No, actually, in Italian is the same, but, but it works somehow better. I feel in English, calling everything a char character it might be a bit confusing. We, we will see how to translate that. Uh, there's a lot of... Um, of work that is done on on making things as clear as possible when we change language and it's not always obvious before you start doing it um but anyway and the other the final one is the dream that i was talking about before what is the dream how you're trying to achieve it etc so um these are these are the step of the background steps um there's a descriptor associated with them which means something good about it something bad about it i can give you um um, an example, uh, for example, I'm reading the, um, the sheet of uh, Hadric, the lieutenant. Uh, for his uh, role, he has, uh, I have accumulated many victories and my reputation as a skilled fighter precedes me. I find it hard to, questions, to question my decision. So um, we know that he has a um, good reputation. He can use that in the game. But also, probably, if somebody questions his decisions, he's not going to take it very well. So every uh, descriptor is uh, structured this way. There's a positive part, there's a negative part. If, for example, if we go proceed and we go to his dark past, uh, it's written, I have seen too many loved ones die. I will not let that happen again, even at the cost of my own life. And now, if you remember, when he goes down the road to perdition, he starts to get scared. So uh, this is a part of his personality. He doesn't want to let anyone die, but then uh, fear creeps in, in a way. So it can create quite interesting characters. Uh, to each of these descriptors, we have a gift associated. 
uh, we have li lists of gifts that are related to the role and then related to art of war um, and, and other uh, other things and uh, well there's fair fair lot of customization that characters can, ha can have but we don't get to the extreme of DD where you have like 50 pages of spells to, to learn by heart so that's not very interesting uh, to me uh, but but characters have pre-made gifts you can make your own if you are familiar with the system um, especially if you if you read the, the SRD you have all the information you need to create new ones but 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 everything it's already made up for you mm -hmm. that make that can certainly fit now with that with that in mind what are you shooting for what would you be shooting for as far as a page count with the English version? Would it be more or less the same page count as as the original, um, or do you th do you think the formatting might um add might add a page or two? Um, so for the core book, uh, it will include already all the stretch goals that we unlocked for the original core book in Italian, and I think we're gonna hover around three hundred pages. Um, I will have to see when we get into the layout because English is a bit uh, more compact than Italian, so we might uh, somehow lose some pages there. Uh, but I wouldn't be too worried because, for example, one of the stretch goals we have for the campaign is that okay, if we reach a certain amount, we can order more art that is going to be only in this English edition. So uh, we will find ways to to fill those gaps, and, and I wouldn't be worried. Then in the campaign, we're going to have a second book called uh, Book of Eclipse. And that will contain everything that was in the Italian version, uh, minus the uh, three roles, because um, in the original campaign, three of the roles were in that book. Now we have all the roles in the in the main book. Um, so that's the only one you, you actually need to play. But the other book uh, is going to have some very interesting stuff. For example, if you want to play as the bad guys, uh, we have rules to play as a, a member of the Hand of the Abyss or one of the Darokar. Um, there's a lot of more information about magic in the second book, and we are gonna. The second book is gonna um, contain all the stretch goals. So um, we plan to unlock a few scenarios during the the campaign, um, and they will go in the second book. And I think that if we if the campaign goes reasonably well, and we unlock everything we have, the second book is gonna be at least another three hundred pages. So it's big. So we are. I think we are looking at five, six hundred pages total. I I don't like to usually uh, evaluate a project on the number of pages because I don't think there is some kind of quality to pages ratio. Um, but but uh, you're gonna get some stuff, so don't worry about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And. I think you mentioned that the thing that the backer kit um, campaign is going to launch in early May. Um, are you planning yeah. on going twenty four days with that, or what's, what's um, the run time? No, I, uh, I think I'm going. We're going to go three weeks. Um, so the the reason for that is that I I do understand that sometimes if if there's a longer time, uh, maybe pe people have time to uh, refill their budget or get their salary or whatever it is, but uh, generally speaking, uh, now this would be our, if, let me think, uh, maybe fifth or sixth campaign. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but um, yeah, I think it's the sixth. But anyway, uh, there's a clear trend, and you can see it in many, many campaigns. Uh, so the the main, like the, the, the majority of backers uh, comes in in the beginning or at the end. And then you have like a, a dead zone in the middle um, where it can be quite hard to keep the campaign interesting for, for, for a longer time. So I found out that three weeks is ideal because then you have the first week where everybody's excited. Then you have a little, little lull in the middle where you can take a break. Um, uh, maybe uh, sometimes you have to talk with the team like hey uh, we unlocked everything we had can we come up with something else you might have to change some plans or or, or thinking like hey can we do something for the end uh, of the campaign that that we didn't uh, think up until now and then you have the end where 
you have all the latecomers because I can see that people, even in real life, they they work in these two modes, like uh, people that come in early and people that come in late. Uh, so in the middle, it's it's very slow usually. Uh, and that's why I don't like to do the four weeks anymore because then you have two weeks in the middle that are kind of slow and it, it can feel like, oh, the campaign is not working and then you have like a boom in the end. Um, so it becomes like it's it's a long time to it's very stressing to run a campaign uh when i run them i'm usually working uh, well this is not my main job but i i do have a, another job during the day so it means that i'm working every evening and four weeks in a row it's uh it's very taxing for for me and my family i have a small kid now i think three weeks is gonna be ideal if somebody cannot manage to to enter immediately, we're gonna have uh, one uh, euros pledge. Uh, you can, if you want access to the pledge manager later, you can just uh, put down like a placeholder in a way and enter later. And I think we're gonna have a, a late pledge, but the late pledge doesn't unlock stretch goals. So if you want to contribute to uh, the books being uh, as as good as they can be, um, I would ask you to enter during the campaign because that's the best way for for us to to see how much material we can add to the books before um, deciding, okay, this, this is all we're going to do. And, and uh, yeah, if somebody comes in late, they get whatever, whatever we unlocked already. All right. That makes sense. That makes sense. And with that said, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. And I do. And as always, thank you for being open to, coming all the way back to my temple and enjoying the madness that happens around here. Thank you very much for having me. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, <clears throat> on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>